Uh, I'm Darren Bell, Director of Technical Services since the beginning of this year at the UK Data Service, and we're based in Colchester at the University of Essex uh, in, in the UK. Okay, so where the UK Data Service fits into all of this, uh, very quickly, we're a, a social sciences repository uh, or, or archive, and we hold around 8,000 surveys, census data, and, and more recently, we've been branching out into different data sources like energy data. Uh, the UK Data Service uh, is a consortium partnership between the Data Archive, uh, who I work for, uh, the G uh, GISC uh, up at Manchester, University College London, Edinburgh and Southampton. So the UK Data Archive is the lead partner in the UK Data Service, but there are a number of other, uh, other important players there as well. The UK Data Archive itself is a member of CESDA, which is the Consortium of European Social Science Data Archives. Uh, so we partner with a number of European repositories, such as GASIS uh, in Germany, FSD, in Finland uh, and, and a number of others. Uh, and SESDA itself is a partner in JOP. So that's where we kind of fit in, in, in the big picture of things. Okay, so ELST is a, a thesaurus product. Uh, ELST stands for European Language Social Sciences Thesaurus. Uh, and this is, this is something that's been hosted traditionally and, and has belonged to the UK Data Archive. Uh, this year we're actually transferring license and ownership of ELST over to CESDA and that's in progress at the moment and as part of the I, uh, migration of IP uh, we're actually transferring some of the technology to a new platform uh, to be hosted on Google Cloud uh, by CESDA themselves. So CESDA uh, have a number of functions and uh, missions, uh, they produce tools, uh, they work on training and trust, uh, but the main tools and platforms they produce something called the CESDA data catalogue uh, which harvests metadata from a number of repositories to produce a centralised catalogue, a CV manager which is for controlled vocabularies which is developed mostly by GASIS, the German archive, uh, and obviously more importantly for this the conversation here, uh, ELS Thesaurus, uh, which is currently hosted at UK Data Service but as I said we'll be migrating quite soon onto the CESDA platform. Now Going back to first principles, asking why thesauri is important might seem like a rather obvious question, uh, but where thesauri really help and fit in is when they are actually used uh, by other data. So in a social sciences context, we use something called DDI, which stands for Data Documentation Initiative. And this is the principal uh, interchange scheme for metadata and data that is used in the social sciences community in Europe and, and North America as well. Now, what you can see here is a very simple example of a D, uh, fragment of a DDI document that has a keyword entry. And in here, we have a keyword called health, um, which by itself is okay, but the real kind of power of interoperability uh, comes when we start using unique identifiers for these keywords. And in this case, we have a URI uh, which uh, tells the uh, tells any kind of development program or any kind of metadata interchange what the unique unambiguous reference of this keyword is. So if you can promote common standards where people start to use URIs and link data URIs, it's, it's obviously a very powerful mechanism for interoperability that underpins fair principles and that, and that underpins a good exchange of metadata. So keyword, keywords like health support local discovery, but once you start using URIs and getting people to use URIs much more commonly, that enables global discovery uh, across the board and even interoperability across different domains. So the SORI are used at a number of different levels. We can apply keywords to study level at data set level, for instance, or what we are most interested in doing over the next couple of years is starting to index individual variables. Uh, so once you have concepts assigned to variables, for instance, you can start doing lots of uh, more interesting discovery. Uh, and uh, I was interested to see Nico presenting the new kind of auto automated text in indexing uh, that's coming in Scodmos because that's an important topic we'll be working on the next couple of years as well to how how to automate metadata assignments of keywords and concepts. So ELST as a thesaurus, uh, we have approximately 3,300 uh, individual terms in there uh, that go down about eight levels as a tree structure. 
We update a new uh, version of ELST uh, with some new additions and some deprecations about once a year. Uh, as a bit of background to thesaurus development, it's not just about coders and programmers. Uh, there are lots of different uh, actors involved in the development of thesaurus. Uh, so obviously data curation staff use keywords on a daily basis to assign to metadata, sysadmins, uh, in the case of ELST, where we currently have 14 languages, we have a, a, you know, a team of translators who work remotely to translate uh, terms from English into the target language. So we have uh, 14 languages, as I said, and Icelandic is, is coming soon as well. So we have a, a diverse and really interesting uh, and enthusiastic user community that supports uh, and develops ELST. Now, currently that's hosted at the UK Data Archive. Uh, and this is what the current system looks like. Now, one of the drivers for moving away from the current system is that it was actually all based around ISO 25694, which is the kind of ISO standard for SORI. And that has a best practice document of a relational structure in SQL to maintain the SORI. Now, I'll come on to that shortly as to some of the drawbacks with that. Uh, but what you can see here is the end product of a lot of nasty uh, data transforms and manipulations because as you can imagine storing uh, keywords and tree structures in SQL and relational databases is not always uh, a very good fit for hierarchical data like this. So the architecture we were working with previously was based uh, with Microsoft SQL uh, persistence layer it was really led by a .NET context, uh, although we, the UK Data Archive has been moving uh, very rapidly in the last couple of years towards Java and open source. Uh, but essentially, the problem with this architecture was that we wanted to serve links data as SCOS, but we also wanted to have a user interface for uh, end users to browse the thesaurus. Now, this ended with us jumping through all sorts of hoops and two different pathways to produce linked data and a browsable interface. So we took the SQL data in the tables, uh, imported that into Solar to flatten it, and then made that available through a browsable interface on ASP.NET. Uh, completely separately, we had to write some really uh, convoluted C sharp to transform the SQL into uh, a bright star DB, which is a triple store, one of the very few triple stores that kind of .NET uh, compliant. And then we serve that into a, a system called Pubby, which uh, Richard Siganiak developed, I think, back in 2010 or 2011. Perfectly good system, uh, but it was a very con convoluted pathway to serve RDF data. So the, a, a number of problems with the previous architecture, as I've been saying, relational structures really do not suit uh, RDF or any type of hierarchical data for that matter. So lots of awkward data transformations that we had to do. Uh, because we were actually using the same interface for administrators and users, uh, we had to make a fair few compromises with the user interface. Uh, and .NET infrastructure really restricts your choices in terms of RDF frameworks and what triple stores are available. So overall, you know, we were glad to make the move to open source uh, because the Java landscape does give you a lot more options in terms of manipulating RDF and the frameworks and libraries that are available to you. And also in the end for the UX, it was confusing because we pointed uh, consumers to two completely different interfaces depending whether they wanted to uh, retrieve linked data or whether they just wanted to browse the thesaurus. So here you can see on the left hand side this is a uh, pubby uh, which was the system we took to serve up linked data and on the right hand side this was the browsable thesaurus in a completely different platform. So the drivers for change were, I mean, they're fairly self-evident, but we wanted to move away from .NET. We wanted to have a single uh, unified front end for users so that that single platform could serve both linked data and could be a friendly uh, browsable interface. Uh, at the back end, uh, we didn't have a very sophisticated ontology editor. Uh, what we were using was an in-house bespoke tool and it couldn't do much more than really just introduce keywords and put them in a tree structure. So we wanted something a bit more sophisticated that, than that. And really we wanted to throw away the whole kind of relational problems that we had and, and really have just a single uh, storage layer that was based on SCOS. 
So what we decided is that we would actually, rather than trying to find one single tool, we would split the editing and the publishing uh, functions so that we could target different audiences and select tools that are appropriate to an editing or publishing function. So as you're probably aware, there are quite a lot of different uh, solutions out there. I mean, we looked at a few, Protégé uh, as, as the kind of uh, granddaddy of them all as, as the open source ontology editor. Unfortunately, Protégé doesn't actually have very good SCOS support. And there, there was a plugin in 2012, but that fell into uh, disuse really. And we found that Protégé was really quite confusing for people who weren't real ontological experts. So we didn't really spend a lot more time on Protégé. Uh, we also looked at Temetrez, uh, which the documentation was really not very good for Temetrez. A couple of commercial products like Top Braid EVN and Pool Party, which are both, you know, really good products, but really quite prohibitively expensive as well. So uh, that wasn't really an option for us. Uh, a couple of years ago, we came across Vocbench, which has been gaining a lot of traction in the last few years. Uh, now, Vocbench is a great tool for editing SCOS ontologies and SCOS XL uh, ontologies and, and for SORI. So we really plumped for Vocbench and at the front end, SCOSMOS as well, uh, because SCOSMOS and Vocbench we found as a pairing were actually really easy to use. I mean, they are really quite sophisticated uh, at the back end, but if you are not uh, a hardcore kind of postdoctoral ontology expert, working with SCOS and Vocbench and uh, Vocbench 3 and SCOSMOS is, is relatively straightforward. So in terms of usability and how they fitted in with uh, our use cases, we, we decided to go with those and pair those together. So the way we've uh, constructed our ontology system, as we call it, is that, as I mentioned before, we actually split out the editing and publishing platforms to target different audiences. So at the back end for our editing platform, we use some, uh, Bockbench 3, uh, which uses uh, GraphDB, uh, which is uh, a triple store. Now, Bockbench 3 can plug into a variety of different triple stores, uh, but GraphDB, GraphDB is the recommended one, and we found this really easy to implement. So once you've actually prepared your thesaurus uh, in Bockbench 3, this is a kind of no code solution almost. What you can do is export your RDF out of Bockbench 3 uh, and you can go into the Fuseki interface in Scosmos uh, and load the same file into Apache Fuseki and you're effectively done. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe oversimplifying, you know, the, the, the complexity of the whole platform. But in terms of get preparing your thesaurus in Botbench, it's just an export and import. And Botbench is actually a pretty sophisticated tool. So you can do lots of transforms from Botbench as you export the data. So we're using Scots Excel uh, for ELST within Botbench, but there are uh, transformations in the user interface that don't require any coding or configuration particularly. You can simply convert Scots Excel uh, into Scots as you go and import that straight into SCOSMOS. So it is, in terms of the threshold or the bar uh, at which you need to be in terms of competence with RDF, uh, you know, this is a very straightforward system. So I'll, I'll probably skip over this very quickly, okay, because uh, I'm conscious of time, uh, but I, if you're not familiar with SCOS, Essentially, uh, what you do is just rip apart what looks like a traditional tree structure and make it into a big network of concepts and properties. So I'm not going to spend too much on time on this because I'm conscious of time. OK, but uh, if you want to use SCOS, it's actually and, and you're not really familiar with it. Uh, it might seem intimidating at first, but I would say the, the basic principles of SCOS you can learn in, in 30 minutes uh, and everything kind of that. Okay. So we currently have uh, SCOSMOS installed on Google Cloud. Uh, now, it so happens that at the same time as we're migrating ELST into SCOSMOS, our English language thesaurus, which is called HACCIT, we're actually doing a migration at the same time. Now, there are two ways, and I've seen a couple of questions about Docker, okay, there are two ways to do this. You, you can actually uh, 
install uh, Scosmos into Docker. Now, I'm not, I'm not a Kubernetes expert, so a couple of people, other people says they've done this, uh, but it is entirely possible uh, to do this on Google Cloud and in Kubernetes. Uh, I've gone the more traditional route uh, for HACCIT on our on-premises installation. But again, you know, the installation is really straightforward. So you can see here, this is a, a simple uh, installation of Scosmos. There's been some minimal branding uh, for CESDA. And, you know, I, I don't want to repeat the things that Nico said, but we have a, a kind of hierarchical view, like you can see here, uh, which displays all the properties for each concept. And we also have an alphabetical view as well. So, I mean, all of this is out of the box. So I, I just want to emphasize that. So if your know, RDF has looked a bit scary or the tooling for that has looked a bit scary before, I would say Scosmos is a very easy route to publishing uh, your RDF vocabularies. Okay, so in terms of the installation of Scosmos, uh, there is a Docker uh, route to do this as well, uh, but I'd have to refer you to a couple of other people in CESDA uh, for the low level technical details of that because I'm not a Kubernetes expert. But there is very, very good documentation uh, around this Scosmos wiki. Uh, now, the installation instructions there are for Ubuntu, uh, but we use CentOS at the UK Data Archive, and we've been able to install it uh, on CentOS with, with, with no particular problems. Essentially, uh, to install Scosmos, uh, you, as long as you've got Java, Apache Fuseki, which basically is the uh, interface into the database so that you can get the the data out uh, you install apache uh, kind of web server or httpd uh, php and scosmos when you're done so uh, the, the whole installation to do it manually probably takes le less than half an hour and is is very very well structured on the scosmos wiki uh, just a couple of gotchas if you are installing this on on red hat or centos uh, I, I, this seems really obvious, but don't forget to open the ports on the firewall daemon, which, which is something I, I spent a, uh, a little while banging my head uh, against a desk before I realised uh, what I'd done. And SE Linux as well. Uh, now, I, I, I might talk to you, Nico, but this is worth pointing out for CentOS uh, because this was quite a nasty little problem. If you are using SE Linux, you, you do have to uh, kind of enable HTTP. PD. Uh, otherwise, you know, again, you, you can spend a long time working out what, what the problem is. But overall, I would say installing Scosmos is very quick uh, and it is very simple. Uh, so we've had no problems with that. Similarly with Vokbench uh, as a tool, in fact, it's much simpler than Scosmos. It's literally uh, a set of jar files pretty much that you copy into a folder. Uh, you run the startup script and, and away you go. Uh, so we have uh, installed that uh, on, on a number of occasions and it, it usually takes under two minutes to install Vokbench uh, and you're away and, and running. Okay. So this is just a quick screenshot of Vokbench for those of you that have not seen it before. This is our administration interface. So we prepare all the data for ELST in here. Uh, as you can see here, we just have a, a keyword called academic ability that displays the number of different things like breath label or might be broader or, or narrow terms. It's a very uh, deceptively simple interface actually because there, there is a lot of sophisticated functionality here under the hood. Uh, and Vokbench, although I think it started life out as a SCOS development tool, it can cope with lots of imports of different uh, RDF namespaces. So it natively supports SCOS, SCOS XL, and Dublin Core. Uh, but if you want to extend this with different namespaces and different vocabularies, uh, it's more than capable of doing that. So from our old system to our new system, uh, we had to do a, a fair amount of data cleansing, which thankfully is now completed. Uh, but we took this initially from our triple store uh, because of a multilingual thesaurus, uh, we had a few problems with uh, encoding and UTF-8. So uh, just a, a mention for the HTML tag plugin in Notepad, uh, that this is really quick and helpful, uh, especially when you're working with Greek, uh, which I do not speak. Uh, and that was quite quite interesting challenge, uh, trying to uh, make sure that we had all the correct encoding for Greek, for example. Uh, just another tip as well, if you are working with RDF, and as long as you don't have millions of triples, I mean, ELST, for instance, is probably around 80,000 triples uh, in uh, the SCOS version. 
Uh, I would say always use the M-triples format rather than Turtle or RDFXML if you're having to do um, manual kind of data cleansing. It's just very flat and very readable. You can load it into Notepad or Excel uh, and do, you know, cleansing, filtering, sorting. So that's just to do uh, data cleansing on, on small, small RDF structures. Okay, all of SCOSMOS, uh, pretty much everything is driven by uh, a, configuration files. Uh, I mean, it is customizable in terms of style sheets and the user interface, maybe not as much as we would like, uh, but basically it's very simple to configure. And there is a file called config TTL where nearly all of your useful options are available and set. So this is an example uh, screenshot from our configuration file where you can see what the base URI for the source is, uh, what the name is and, and those kinds of things. So just to emphasize that un unlike something like Protégé, which can be quite a challenge to configure and customize, uh, Scosmos uh, is, is really very user-friendly uh, for sysadmins in terms of being able to configure it. Uh, and you can do simple customizations really by just uh, putting a parameter in here, pointing it to a, a style sheet, and you can customize it very simply that way. So just to talk about uh, how we serve link data, opposed to just browsing uh, the, uh, the user interface. Now, concepts uh, have a globally unique identifier, so persistent identifiers for concepts, you could call it, I guess. Now, within the ELSE thesaurus, all of our uh, URIs are of the same format. We use uh, GUIDs uh, to uniquely identify each concept. So each concept will have a URI, as you can see at the top here, which will be ELSE says do you, and then, then a GUID string. However, the HTML page will look slightly different. So you have to go through a couple of steps for SCOSMOS to serve up linked data uh, properly in the sense of resolving any particular URI. So the top uh, URL, for instance, uh, if I type that into the browser, in order for that to resolve properly, uh, you just have to create a couple of uh, rewrite rules in the, uh, I think it's the HTA access file uh, or, or whichever it might be, the HTTPD conf file. Uh, but that works perfectly well and serves both uh, RDF XML data. I think it comes back down as JSON LD actually, uh, if you want to retrieve that. Additionally, which I, I didn't realize until a few days ago, JSON LD is actually embedded into the HTML pages as well, which is a very useful feature. So as a developer, if you want to pass the HTML page for the JSON LD, you can also do that as well. There is also a API which has a lot of kind of verbs in there, so you can retrieve useful things uh, from the SCOSMOS interface. So again, I want to emphasize this is kind of all out of the box, so you don't have to do lots of additional development and coding to make REST APIs or linked data endpoints available. Uh, this all, all comes pretty much uh, pre-installed. Uh, there is a link here to the Swagger documentation as well, which is very clear. And I, I'd like to kind of congratulate Mika as well for, for writing, you know, some really clear and helpful documentation here. So yeah, serving linked data uh, through the through system is, is we found really, really straightforward. Okay, so finally, uh, else will be going live on the 19th of November. Uh, we're doing some kind of final testing uh, before we do the final kind of production lead-in. Uh, we are still investigating SCOS XL support and working out quite how that works. Now, I, I, I know there is some SCOS XL support in SCOSMOS at the moment. Uh, now, I'll be interested to see how that develops over, over the next year. Uh, but yes, we, we're doing a, a few final checks on that. Uh, what I would say as well about using Botbench alongside SCOSMOS is SCOSMOS is generally a lot easier uh, to use than Botbench. Uh, I think Botbench, as I said, is deceptively simple. It has a lot of sophisticated functionality and there are certain things you can get wrong very easily, especially things around inferencing, which aren't always immediately obvious from the, from the uh, user interface. Uh, SCOSMOS has been a dream really, it's, it's just been so simple uh, compared to the tooling we had to use before, so we're really happy about it. And it means that when we go live, we can actually publish else, uh, publish the URIs and encourage our user community instead to 
to start uh, using these URIs, which will really promote and support interoperability. So uh, at the same time, we'll be launching Hasset uh, on November the 19th as our English language thesaurus. Uh, so once we've got that live in November, the next step for us then is to look at Scosmos to support not just thesauri as we're doing at the moment, but also controlled vocabularies, which at the end of the day are just simple uh, tree structures. So that's something that we're, we're going to be looking at in 2021. So overall, uh, yes, well done, Miko, a, a great product. But yeah, I hope that's been a little bit helpful to give you some kind of user, uh, a user perspective on, on how Scosmos works for us.